Today, our honored guest, Masu Wei Ho Han Yo Wu, and Mac Kenten Yema will give great discussion on finding your place in a developing Myanmar. Before we start, I would like to call Ho Wei Yu, the Director of Strategy and Development of Space, to, be, to give a brief introduction on our region. So thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate your presence uh, here in, uh, at Parvi Institute. You know, we started this program, you know, and uh, we started thinking about this in November 2015 to open a university, the first not-for-profit residential uh, liberal arts and sciences university in Myanmar. You know, but then we realized that we need to raise about 50 million dollars at least, and we need about 40 acres of land. And we are still on our way, uh, but then this is a precursor to the uh, to the university that we want to build. So we have Parmi Institute now to prove two things: that liberal arts and science science education is important, and that uh, people in our country uh, who, have, who have been very successful, you know, uh, in their businesses need to donate money to causes uh, beyond you know uh, donating to religious causes. Uh, I'm obviously a fan of. Uh, um, you know, donating to religious causes, but we also need to be aware that we need to give money to educational causes, to health care. Um, so we're taking a bit of time back there in, uh, in that uh, regard. But then we're gaining momentum. A lot of people have recognized that we're, you know, we genuinely want to create change agents in our country, you know, so that people, uh, leaders in our country, don't just come from elite families, but from communities and uh, different parts of the country and the government people that, uh, that they are part of. And so at Parmi Institute, we have programs for uh, all different uh, ages. Uh, so you know, if, if you are between about 20 to 35 years old, then we have Parmi Leadership Program, which is the four and a half month program. Um, cost, um, like we say it costs 1,000, but then you know, it costs really not a, a, a factor for us in determining um, whether a person can get it or not. Um, if you, uh, if a person cannot pay, then we accept that free of charge. And the the mission of this program is to uh, do uh, two things in the program. So to get into the best jobs in the country in the private sector or the public sector. Uh, some of our students are working in the parliament. Uh, some are working in banks. You know, they used to study engineering, but then they're working as auditors in banks. You know, so. To showcase the, uh, the fact that you know, a liberal arts and science education trains you to to be malleable and to to perform very well in whatever field you're put into. Uh, we also have programs like uh, skills for complex problem solving uh, that target uh, people in their 30s and 40s. Uh, uh, people, these people are usually um, uh, at the mid managerial level in companies and organizations. And we also have uh, courses like change uh, and uh, project management uh, course uh, that will be offered by uh, an ExxonMobil executive. He used to work in Exxon ExxonMobil for about 30 years and he'll be coming here to Parmi to train people at this very senior level companies and organizations. So we are on our way uh, to finally establish uh, Parmi University, but you know, we cannot do it alone. So please help us and I hope that you know, um, this, you know, this Parmi talk series is also another showcase example uh, where you know, we uh, try to invite uh, people with high social capital. Uh, we've had the U.S. ambassador, Mrs. Uh, Scott Marcio. We have a uh, city mark uh, owner, uh, the Wendt, came and talked to us as well. Uh, uh, but then this time it will be a little, a little different and I hope, hope you like it and hope you have lots of questions on it as well. Thank you very much.
She believes that sustainable and responsible businesses will have a key role to play in developing the human capital of the new Myanmar. Our next panelist is Go Han Yeo Woo. He is an architect who graduated from Yale College in 2015. While at Yale, he founded the Myanmar Project, a student group that ran empowerment workshops for Korean refugee youth. Go Han Yeo Woo also proposed to Aung San Suu Kyi as the Yale Chair Fellow for Fall 2012 and helped organize Rose Woo's visit to Yale during her first visit to the U.S. after her release. After graduating from Yale, he worked at an architecture and interior design firm based in New York City. This fall, Ko Han Yu Wu will pursue a Master in Architecture at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. And our third panelist is Mike Kenchan Yema, who is a writer and poet from Yangon. She was recognized as Judge's Choice Writer in the Ithaca College Writing Contest 2016 after placing first in both fiction and poetry. In June of 2016, she co-founded Yangon Literary Magazine, one of Myanmar's premier bilingual literary and art platform. Continuing her work in the literary community of Myanmar, she coordinated and hosted the Indian Literary Forum focusing on the voices of women writers in Southeast Asia. She is the founder and manager of Nase Community Space, an open space dedicated to cultivating art and literary culture in the heart of downtown Myanmar. She is currently studying sociology and literary studies at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Now, I would like to call Masu Weiji, Ko Han Yo Wu, I can tell you about and hope you to come up on the stage. We always used to have a lot of um, uh, very uh, uh, high level people, uh, you know, uh, for our uh, talk series and. You know, um, it, it, uh, it really helps us to spread the word uh, of Parmi as well. But then, you know, I thought about all these uh, different uh, leaders in other countries, in, in the U.S., for instance, uh, you know, um, people like Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, they started, you know, their companies when they were still in their early 20s, you know. And so I thought, well, you know, how about in our country? We all have very talented people, uh, but, you know, uh, we're not taking as as many initiatives as, as, as uh, other younger people in other, other countries. So I thought, well, you know, um, and also, you know, we tend to give a lot of respect to older people in our country, but then you know, when, 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 when it's a young person, then they usually try to underestimate their abilities. Um, so I thought, well, perhaps, you know, I, I could uh, you know, ask my, my friends, uh, you know, who are taking initiatives in, our, in their own lives, and, and, and I hope that perhaps they can also, you know, uh, inspire people and also inspire, uh, uh, get inspiration from uh, from other younger people, and so hopefully, um, I think this is, this is not not hopefully. I do think that it's going to be a very interesting discussion. <laughs> so um, without uh, boring any further with my comments, uh, if I may start, um, you know, um, if you could describe yourself in one minute, Hill, uh, and we can begin with that. Hi. Um, so I am an entrepreneur, uh, and I'm. Uh, 
Um, thank you for having me, first off. Uh, I would say I consider myself a maker uh, and a creative above everything else. Um, I, ever since I was little, I was always interested in art. Uh, but of course, the Burmese traditional idea of art is that art is a craft, right? Um, it's part of the band. Um, and so uh, it was always difficult for me to realize that art could actually do so much more. And so later in high school, when I started um, realizing that art could be an agent for uh, social and to, some, to, to a certain extent political change, um, it, was, it was really empowering. Uh, and I think I think of architecture in the same way. Um, I'm still, uh, I'm about to uh, pursue my further education, but my hope is that art uh, and architecture and design can um, help me shape and positively contribute to MLS development. Hi, I'm Kit and I'm a writer and a poet and also a troublemaker. I think that's another word for a sociologist here, I'm not sure, but um, I guess one of my favorite things to do is to research and ask tough questions about gender, identity politics, and basically everything that makes people uncomfortable. So, yeah, I guess that's just me in one word, troublemaker. Okay, <laughs> 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 that's part of the fun here. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm trying to um, uh, break, uh, you know, segment this into different uh, themes. You know, Perk will talk about. I try to get to know the panelists, uh, their personal stories, as well as you know, professional um, growth and what they plan to do in their country, and also you know, our, uh, their views, um, including some of my views and, and your views, and as to how we uh, want to you know uh, be a part of our country. You know, so just just to start from the beginning, uh, if you could share with us um, some personal stories on. Know, some of your uh, the challenges that, that you had uh, uh, early in, in your early well, it's still in your early in your life, but and, you know some of the challenges that you've had uh, and how you overcame those challenges, you know, before college or while you're in college, and how do you become uh, you? Yeah. So, for instance, you know, when I was when I was uh, if I may interrupt, you know, uh, uh, when I went to college in the states, then uh, it was the first time that I saw two men kissing. You know, I thought it was you know, very disgusting thing in my in my whole life, you know, and uh, it took me a couple of years to process that that image, that 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 morning at, at home in the in the in the dining hall, and uh, and I didn't didn't realize until a couple of years later that I am interested in men as well as, as women. So you know, things like that. It took some so many years for me to become uh, to become very comfortable with, with myself. Um, you know, a lot of us, uh, you know, uh, a lot of um, because all the people here went to um, private schools, uh, and they seem like you know uh, uh, we all live very protected lives. But I think we all went through many challenges that we can we could share. Right. Um, so I think a personal challenge that um, I faced first uh, when I was in college, I would say, uh, it was when I was uh, I I uh, um, it's a bit different from when you my story is. I always knew that I was going to go to the States to study, and I think I was uh, sort of like actually prepared to do that. But uh, in a sense, I guess my personal struggle and challenge was uh, uh, more pronounced when I moved back to, uh, when I moved to Asia for a bit. I, I studied abroad in Beijing um, after two years of studying in Swahili in the US. And um, Swahili is a very small town. My high school has always been a very small place community as well, very tight-knit. We know all the people that we see every day. Uh, but moving to Beijing was a very uh, different uh, kind of environment. It was very new to me. And um, I was only there with uh, three of my other program mates um, in study abroad. And um, at that time, I socially, I didn't know how to reach out to more people. Like, because I, but at that point, I had to do it because um, I was only there uh, with three other people, and I knew that I have to like uh, build. Even though my Chinese isn't that great as well, I had to learn to uh, open up myself more and be more open to seeing new people, meeting new people, learning from them, and, uh, and integrating all these people in the point of life. And uh, I think that was a very good uh, chance for me. And it was. It really 
really changed the way uh, I am as a person, uh, and it shaped me uh, to become the person I am today. Yes. Um, I think that could talk perhaps about um, something I had to go through in general in middle and high school, which was, I think, being raised by very business-minded, practical parents. Um, it was always very difficult to get them to understand uh, what it meant to be an artist, or, or what it meant to be creative, and what it meant to want to uh, pursue something that they didn't see uh, tangible or more monetary value in. And, uh, you know, I remember when I was little, um, I drew a lot. I loved to draw. And uh, my dad would always wonder, like, what is the value in this? You know, can you make a living um, from this? And I also remember when I was, uh, I think, in eighth grade, I was part of this dance performance uh, in school. And um, I remember telling my mom to come, but she was, she just refused to come because she, you know, and I was young at the time. Uh, and I, I'm quite close to my mom, so I'm not trying to make her look terrible. But she, at the time, she she refused to come to my performance uh, because she didn't want to approve of my artistic pursuits. Um, and so I think that's something that a lot of young creative Burmese people can relate to. Um, over, it, it took a lot of work. Uh, I, 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 there wasn't this one moment when they realized that there was value in that. I think eventually they saw that you know every great thing in the world, right, from the iPhone to um, uh, even the computer was imagined by some creative person. And um, buildings need to be drawn, uh, which is why I decided to pursue architecture. Um, and so eventually they, they realized that uh, there was a place for um, creatives uh, in, in our country. Um, I would say I struggled a lot with uh, hopelessness, not to be uh, sad, but I studied in Ithaca, New York, which is a small, small town in upstate New York, and is it is precisely 8,533 miles away from Yangon. I think it's miles? I'm not quite sure, but it's almost exactly halfway across the world. And I felt quite hopeless because um, I remember being a freshman, and I kept thinking, I don't think I would ever make a difference from this point in like in this location or my home city, my hometown, my home country. And I felt that way for a long time until I came back here and I met these amazing people in the art community who basically took me in and kind of we kind of made a family together and started changing um, how young people view art and how older people view younger people who are doing art. So I feel like that's one of the things that a lot of people talk about, especially that we discussed in this group, was the hopelessness that you feel when you're really studying or when you're on that journey to make it to that point where you want to be is sometimes you think, okay, I don't think I'm doing enough or I might not make it. But I feel like sometimes you just meet the right people to take you there and I think that's really important takeaway that you value the community that you're in. <laughs> That's my entrance. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so, um, the, a lot of you talked about how, you know, you, uh, you, um, some of you were prepared, some of you were not prepared, even, uh, even if you were prepared in the U.S. and you're not so prepared in Beijing, you know. So how, how much of uh, those decisions did you make by yourself? How much were the, when were they, um, are shaped by your parents' suggestions or your friends' suggestions. So I really didn't listen to my parents. 
uh, advice a lot, and I feel like that is a mistake. I'm serious, that is actually a mistake. Because your parents probably know a lot more than you. I'm, I'm not kidding. But it's also good to go and make those mistakes, because then you really find out who you are uh, when you're making those mistakes, because then you can say, oh yeah, I made a mistake. And that's one of the most important things and humbling things that you can actually learn as uh, you know, a person growing up trying to educate themselves. Because if you learn that when, only when you're older, that, oh yeah, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, then it's going to be difficult if you can't say that. You know, when you're 30, 40, you can't say that, oh, I made a mistake. Because it's, it's okay to make a mistake. Right? Um, and uh, I, I think to add to your point about listening to parents, that I, I don't know if it's necessarily about listening to your parents or not listening to your parents. I think the main thing is to have initiative. Um, uh, and to make sure, I, I think in Burmese culture, it's very easy to sort of go with the flow. Um, and uh, people tend to be quite passive, myself included. And I think, uh, you know, over the years, especially in the US, when you're exposed to some incredible, uh, you know, people and other incredible students, um, you start to realize that these opportunities you are only there if you if you're seeking them out and if you grab them for yourself. Um, I think I I think my parents also uh, changed me in a way that they wanted me uh, to try to uh, they always gave me the option that uh, studying abroad is a, an available option, right? And they try to put me on that track. And uh, but going to banking itself, it, it, it was my decision because um, I really wanted to experience a different kind of uh, environment uh, while I was in college. Even though uh, the United States is great, um, I really like uh, studying at my um, uh, Swapor as well. But I would, you know, I made that choice because I, I wanted uh, more like. Real life, like city type, uh, uh, kind of like learning experience uh, in during my college years. Yeah. I think I think that can relate to you guys because my I'm a very overprotective uh, mom, so uh, I listen to her always, uh, but then I only tell her when I have done things. So uh, when I was in the states, uh, I went to uh, Trenton, New Jersey, to intern. Uh, it's, it's one of the most dangerous cities in the U.S. You know, it's, um, and so I asked, I told my mom I'm going to, uh, to California. And I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I actually got, I almost got shot when I went, went there. Uh, I, was, I was waiting for a bus there to go to my internship place. And then somebody got shot, somebody who was uh, standing beside me got shot. Um, so I still haven't told her that. <laughs> um, so, you know, what would you want to say? What would you say to that to that person, you know, um, when you're searching for uh, the, the soul inside of you, you know, the, the person inside of you, uh, when, you're, when you're scared, um, you know, what would you have, what do you think you, you would have said, looking back? Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a big question, but um, I feel like I would, I'm definitely not, I'm probably going to say this like when I'm, like 10 years from now, I'm probably not, I, I don't know what I would say, but I would definitely tell them that life is um, not, ne never turns out to w what you think it's going to be. If you make a plan, it's definitely going to go wrong, so just let it go wrong and it'll be fine. You know, that, that's the only thing I feel like I have to tell my younger self, where, who always made plans, who was like 30 minutes, uh, earlier than the time that I'm supposed to be there. You know, I had everything organized the night before. I would run it through my head and everything would still go wrong. So at some point, you do have to learn that, yeah, it's fine, that like, Murphy's Law. If it's going to go wrong, it's definitely going to go wrong. And that's okay, you know. It happens, but the next day you're going to wake up and you're still going to go do things and you're still going to live, so it will pass. take is that um, we always have to uh, strive for something, we need to have a target, right? And we have to initiate ourselves like more towards that. And because uh, like I agree with Ken that like 
things can always go wrong, facts can always go wrong, but I believe that uh, the important thing is we have to keep on trying whatever, what, even if things go wrong. Uh, because I think when you're constantly trying, then when, when the opportunity strikes, you will have the resources and skills like to take full advantage of it. And uh, even and even when things go wrong, we will also have that resources to you know uh, to fall back on and uh, move on as like a quality of life, I would say. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else uh, I can add, but I think um, I. I remember when I was young, um, I was often quite shy, and even you know, if my mom told me to go talk to, uh, if we were at a hotel, say, and she told me to go talk to the reception, uh, the receptionist, I would be super intimidated. And um, a part of it I attribute to to the culture here. I think that uh, kids here aren't necessarily conditioned to or encouraged to speak up. Um, so I would just say. You know, don't be scared to, to speak up and, and say whatever. And uh, I think um, I, I think eventually I, I wish I told I wish my younger self were more confident because um, I think I would have turned out you know a lot I don't know a lot a lot better than that. So I think we've had a pretty you know a good idea of who these people are. So I'm going to move on to a little uh, bigger picture. You know, how. Um, uh, Involving uh, your position to come back for you, and in the future for the two of you to come back or not come back. You know, what, what are you thinking? Um, you know, how, how how do you place yourself within? You know? Yeah, um, I could definitely see Myanmar as a um, in, in the next like few years. I could definitely see Myanmar becoming a better place uh, to uh, to uh, business. And, uh, I can see that the economy is going to become like more inclusive, and uh, from that, like, uh, we also definitely have like a lot of things that we have to work on. For instance, uh, I believe even though uh, right now it's uh, much better than like years before, like five years before, but uh, there are still like, things that the government should, the government and Myanmar like people should, should be working on. I still believe that we have a lot of work to do on the economy side uh, because we, I. I believe that um, we there are still people out there who are struggling with these day to day cooks and we need to make sure that there are more, more businesses like, set up in this country to help uh, people to help those people have like, regular incomes, jobs, and uh, I believe that um, the political situation should also be uh, more or less stable so that. Um, People can go to work or to school, but knowing that they are safe. Um, and lastly, I believe that there, there should be the work should be done more in the um, healthcare sector as well, because um, in order for the country to move forward, we need to make sure that people are uh, provided with uh, basic and good like, uh, healthcare services. So um, yeah, in the next ten years, I I, I believe that I. My role in helping, my role in this like changing country would be just that I will be. Uh, uh, I hope that my I will be able to employ more people in my businesses. Uh, will be able to provide them with more uh, training and for them to develop and grow together with our company and with the country as well. Um, I uh, unlike uh, Ori, I. I'm about to start my graduate studies, so I won't be back for a little while. Um, but I, my long-term goal has always been to come back to Yankong. Um, I think, I, I'm a firm believer that those of us who had the privilege of uh, getting private education here in Yango, um and going abroad, um, I think we have a responsibility to, to try our best to come back uh, and try to uh, play a positive role here. And so, I think ideally in uh, a few years' time, I'll be back. Um, I'd like to start my own architecture practice uh, here in Yango. I think that the market is not quite ready uh, for uh, designers and uh, for, you know, because I, I don't think people are willing to pay uh, design fees yet. Um, but once that happens, uh, um, I think there'll be a lot of opportunities uh, for me to practice here. And I also see that as an opportunity to, um, 
I guess, teach uh, in that I would hope that I'm able to uh, teach my employees and uh, sort of spread my knowledge base um, based on you know, my experiences and the things I've learned uh, abroad. I think that a lot of employers probably feel that way and feel that responsibility that uh, you're not just uh, these people's boss, but also in many ways their mentor and their teacher, uh, not just in the professional world, but also uh, you know, in terms of how to present themselves, uh, uh, social um, skills, and, and uh, a lot of other aspects of life. Um, so my work, personal work in writing, deals a lot with uh, the Burmese narrative. The Burmese narrative as in uh, a narrative that is told through the point of view of a Burmese individual, or, or the person who, a person who lives in this country, and um, what I'm talking about is in fiction and in uh, basically fiction writing, and um, since I'm a writer, I feel like that is one of my main goals, Co coming back here, not uh, only coming back here physically, but um, also mentally going back to my roots as a uh, young Burmese woman, and kind of creating this uh, narrative that is lost. Because if you go to a bookstore, uh, practically anywhere, and uh, I'm talking about like the international like, chain stores that you see in City Mart or the airport, um, you go to the book section and you go to the, the Asian, Southeast Asian book section, and you see a lot of books about Myanmar, but they're written by uh, Western people. They were written by people who have come to do research here. They lived here for a few years, and they wrote, you know, either fiction or historical fiction about the same thing, basically. Uh, it's about uh, the past 20 years, and I personally would like to change that because I feel like we, as a people, are not defined by our history. Not to negate or forget that military history, but not to let it consume us as a person. Because I feel like, uh, you know, as a country, we're more complex. We have more stories to tell than just, oh, somebody wrote something political. They were sent to jail. They got out of jail. You know, that is not the only plot line that you can write for our country. So when you, <laughs> so when you, when you come, you know, when you, uh, you come back to the country, you know, so um, talking about you know, um, other looking outside for inspiration a lot of times when we want to describe our country, uh, but then there are, uh, and also looking at you know uh, perhaps also a lot of Western leaders when we want to draw inspiration. But then I want to know uh, who do you see you know uh, which Myanmar person leader uh, do you see that, uh, that as an inspirational person that, that you know, has mentored you you know. Uh, in passing or in over months or over years, um, who are those people in your life? One second. Yeah, um, so the person that I have in mind is not a leader in the public, but my own great grandmother, who I got to, who I was lucky enough to know for about 14 years until she passed away. Um, as a teenager, I didn't really know much about her because she was uh, about 70, 80 years old. And she was scary. She was, you know, she would sit in uh, her bedroom and she would ask people to do things. She would never talk to you. You would, you have to sit under, like, on the floor when she would sit on the chair. And so just a lot of intimidating things that didn't allow me to talk to her on a personal level. And um, about a year ago, we went to her village in like about two hours away from Mandalay, and I met. Her sister, who is now about uh, 60 years old, and she was telling me about how my great grandmother had taken her, their mother, and her five sisters down to Mon State from Mandalay during the Second World War because Mandalay was being bombed. So basically, the city was uh, torn apart from what we know in history. And she was a teenager. She took her mom and her five sisters and trekked down to Mont State, and on the way, she, uh, you know, she cut her hair, she dressed up as a boy just to make sure that her family was safe, that she was safe, 
she sold waterfronts to make ends meet, and then um, yeah, she she did a lot of things that she didn't need to do at the age of uh, 14 and 15. And I didn't know that until uh, you know years after she passed away. So I feel like she's really one of uh, the role models for me because you know all the things she did is uh, was for her family and uh, eventually and when you think about it all the things your ancestors have done basically were for you to be here right now so it's really uh, inspiring when you think about it that way um, I uh, I think similar to Ken, my person, or the person who, Burmese person who shaped me, uh, also was a, a leader in the traditional sense. Um, but she, so she was my art teacher uh, when I was in elementary school, um, and her name was Chao Yibing. And I, I think if you're in the art world, you might know of her. Uh, she's one of the more well-known uh, Burmese artists internationally uh, at the moment, and. She actually is an artist in exile uh, because a lot of her work um, is about the socio-political environment of Myanmar and um, a lot of it is very politically uh, challenging work and so it makes sense that she doesn't live here because um, she would probably not be allowed to do what she does. Um, but when, she, when I was younger, she, I remember she taught me um, art and it was more just how to draw, how to do things, but um, she, she was also eventually the person who introduced me to the idea that art doesn't have to be passive, right? You go to uh, Se and you see all these paintings of landscapes and portraits and um, it's all like beautiful and perfect, but um, art, can, art doesn't have to be that and art isn't just that. And, uh, she basically showed me that um, art can challenge, art can be an agent. Um, and uh, I think uh, something you said made me think of her as well earlier, that um, coming back to Myanmar isn't just about physically coming back, but also uh, connecting with uh, Myanmar as a place, connecting with Myanmar through your work. Uh, and you know, she's someone, she lives in Queens in New York right now, um, but she's someone who is still very much in Myanmar uh, through the work that she does. So, you know, I you have all these people that really inspire you, but also, you know, at, at times when, when challenges come to you, you are the only one that you have who can solve these challenges, you know, and, and especially in our country, you know, we cannot just wait for things to happen. We need to, you know, be act proactive and, you know, take thing, things into our lap and solve them. Uh, so I think it would be really, uh, it would be relevant for you, especially as a business woman, um, you know, the challenge, if you could talk about the challenges that you, you faced and how you try to overcome those challenges. You know, uh, challenges that uh, that are inherent to the culture or the situation here, or perhaps challenges that you know um, regarding uh, ideas that we brought from the U.S. or from other countries, and uh, and then they turn out not to, to work well here. Um, I think oh, the the challenges that I faced was uh, human resources here is, is one of the uh, big challenge for me in starting my like uh, starting my own company, starting my own business. I find it uh, very tough to uh, recruit uh, people and uh, that will work well with me, especially in the beginning, right? After I just uh, moved back, right? Because I didn't, uh, I couldn't really, I didn't, I myself, I didn't have like an understanding of like what the working culture here is like, what bosses expect the uh, the staff to do here, the employees, uh, your colleagues to do here. So um, I had a tough time, uh, yeah, uh, recruiting a team that will work together with me. Um, but later on, worse, I realized that um, the that um, the skills that they have can be easily trained, really. Mm -hmm. But it is the problem of the, mm -hmm. their attitude, their attitude and uh, the their uh, mindset about uh, work uh, itself that has to be uh, really uh, just uh, morphed. Um, as I was like working together with them, I have to really try to uh, you know show them that it is really they have to take more initiative uh, when they are doing their work 
and I expect them to take more initiative. Uh, I can't just like give them. Sometimes I have to um, try to like micromanage things because I'm afraid that it won't get done on time or what. Uh, I couldn't delegate uh, things very well because um, I don't I don't know what my staff could or could not do. So uh, at that time I had to learn to gauge that, and really later on was I had to really communicate that it is about taking more initiative and uh, taking ownership about your own work and uh, be pr being proud of like what you're doing, like what about your work. And um, yes, I, and I think this is a, a thing that. Um, the employers should always like remind their, uh, always tell their staff, their um, uh, employees and their staff that they could always do better. They're always like room for improvement. I will always uh, tell my staff about the opportunities how they could uh, improve, and uh, I wouldn't be mad if they asked me for a raise. Like just communicate it out, uh, you know, clearly. Uh, there are people who have left uh, our company. Because uh, they thought that they weren't, uh, they're expecting a raise, and I, I, I just like simply just, uh, yeah, ignored it, you know, ignored their concern. But um, really, it would take more communication between the the, um, the staff and uh, the boss as well, you know. So I think communicating out issues is really important uh, on the, the workplace culture and taking more initiative. And, and work is also really important. And I think these are the issues that I have faced, and I'm still work. I'm, I'm still facing them every day, and I'm also working to become a better uh, leader in that sense uh, of uh, trying to open up my uh, the concerns of my staff and employees, and uh, trying to uh, train them in both their skills and their attitude uh, towards work. Do you want to share a specific story where you? Know, Yeah, 
um, as I would I like to share it, one of my favorite books about Myanmar is uh, Burmese Heart. It's written like he said, most of the books about Burma was not written by it's not written by like uh, uh, Myanmar authors or uh, writers, right? But Burmese Heart is uh, actually a memoir of a Myanmar woman. Uh, it's co-authored by one of a uh, uh, friend as well, Vanessa. Yeah, and it's about the, uh, the protagonist of the story. Uh, she is a Tizan Monai, who is the wife of uh, Uyanai, who is uh, one of the 30 comrades uh, in the uh, Indian army. And uh, her father was Ma uh, Mo, who was the president of uh, the country at one point. So um, through her memoir, I I realized that she was living through, uh, and she, the book was from the, her, her whole life was very very turbulent, I would say. Like, the, it wasn't like, uh, because the country is going through so many like social changes, political changes uh, all the time, and it was very uncertain at all the time, like uh, throughout her life. And through her memoir, I could uh, feel her strength and courage uh, to live uh, like she has to, uh, even though when things are very uncertain. And I think right now, today, the, the current, uh, today, right, in Myanmar, uh, we would say that all oh, things are still uncertain, right? We shouldn't be investing in Myanmar because, oh, this investment law is not very clear. Uh, we say that, but I think that we should still, I, I'm, her, her book really made me like more uh, optimistic about you know the days that we're living through. I mean, so it wouldn't hurt for us to try out new things at this age, even though there may be risk, right? But, um, but I just learned that you have to be really uh, resilient and, uh, to. Uh, I I would I very much admire her resilience and her book really made me more optimistic person about uh, living. I this is a bit cliche, but um, I I really like Wuthe Mu's books, uh, especially River of Lost Footsteps. And um, I know some people are critical of it, but I think it it was really um, eye opening for me because most young Myanmar people think about our history as uh, the last few decades, right? We, we think Bojo Onsen and everything after is Myanmar history. And we forget that we have centuries long histories, uh, histories in plural. Um, and uh, I think particularly with River of Lost Footsteps, it was the first time uh, that I read about, you know, uh, basically Myanmar pre-Myanmar as we know it today, where the boundaries were more fluid, uh, there were all sorts of different people coming in and out and across borders, uh, which is why our country is so ethnically rich. And I think for me, uh, as someone who is from a Chinese Burmese family, since I was, you know, little, I always wondered, like, oh, am I even Burmese? Like, uh, obviously I am, but you know, uh, always had an identity crisis uh, with regards to that. And I think um, reading uh, reading about sort of the history of migration and how all the different populations. Uh, formed uh, what we know of as Myanmar today was really um, helpful. Um, my book is actually quite boring because it's a research paper by Che Akia on the, how women fit into Bur uh, colonial Burmese times and reconfiguring what, like, the what modernity of Burmese women in colonial times and now. So. Relating back to what you said, um, she really focused on identity politics during the time and how women fit into the current political situation and also uh, basically were a big part of rebelling against colonial power. And uh, she really went into detail. This is a sociological paper published by Cornell. It's really amazing, but also a long read. But I'll give you a gist, which is basically that she talks about how um, during the colonial times, there was a lot of migration from especially India and the empire, between empires basically, 
And so there was a lot of uh, xenophobia from people who were uh, Burmese and people especially who were uh, native to the country who were not, who felt that they were being squeezed. Basically, who, basically this is a pattern you see when you uh, see xenophobia in a uh, state. You see uh, people who feel like they're pressured, people who feel like they don't have space for their own, and she basically reveals that in uh, a step-by-step -step process and ties that to how women were seen during the time because women were basically seen as a commodity. And basically between men, and uh, between native men and between foreign men, women became a really political figure because um, you know everything is political, and especially for women during uh, colonial times and even now, uh, it is always a struggle for power and rights and uh, the ability to decide for yourself. So you talk about how you know, the country could be a lot more fluid, or, you know, it used to be more fluid at a certain point in our history. Now, how do you see you know, our country becoming kind of more integrated? You know, because we, uh, in the past, that might it may not be very obvious you know, with the disparity in wealth, for instance, or you know, with um, uh, with uh, you know, people not understanding each other because we're from different ethnic groups or different religions, or um, uh, and also with the you know, minorities, you know, LGBTI uh, groups, or you know, women issues. Uh, you know, we have very few ministers in our country. I think there is only one minister at the moment who is female. Um, so how do you see, you know, Myanmar? Uh, what do you think we could do as, as younger people you know, to make it a more integrated uh, society, uh, uh, not just in Yangon, but also outside of Yangon in other parts of our country? Um, I, I think that's a, a very difficult question to answer, obviously. Um, uh, and I, I think, but I think it's a question that everyone, you know, wonders. Uh, and wishes they have the answer to. Um, I, I'm going to talk about just uh, something uh, that might sort of get at that, but not necessarily address it. Um, I, so for the past two years, I, I was living in uh, New York City, and um, the, the laundromat, which is where you do laundry, because uh, there's no uh, laundry in some buildings in New York City, um, the laundromat I went to in the East Village, a lot of the workers were actually Bama, uh, or from Yakai, or Mijina, or wherever. Uh, it was owned by a Vietnamese uh, family, but uh, the workers all happened to be from Myanmar. And uh, I slowly realized that, because you know you, you can kind of tell uh, when you see a Myanmar person. And so obviously I would just talk to them in Myanmar. Uh, eventually I realized that every time I went to do laundry, I would talk to them and like, ask them where they were from and like uh, ask them about their life back in uh, whether it was in Beijing State or in Yakai or in Michina. I would ask them about their lives and then that made me wonder like if I met this person in Myanmar would I have talked to them in the same way uh, and the answer is probably no right because I think in Myanmar people don't just talk very nicely to strangers and when you go to a restaurant you don't ask um, the waiter or you know whoever is working there you don't ask them how they're doing or what their life is like uh, and many uh, and I think particularly not if you know they look to be a different ethnicity or if they're a different religion from you um, but I think one thing uh, that a lot of us you know especially those of us who studied abroad you know we, we, we've We've experienced that Western culture of uh, being friendly to people and saying hi. And I think, I think, I, this seems really silly, but I think that on a very basic level, people just need to talk more um, in, in Yango. I think, uh, obviously, there are a lot of barriers to that. Um, we also don't have a lot of public spaces where people can do that. But I think, I, I, I think as long as we start nurturing a culture where, um, you know, you, you you talk to like, pe because people tend to stick within their own ethnic groups as well. I like, think you just need to like branch out and uh, uh, get to know other people, get to know their culture. Um, if your neighbor is Mon, you know, try to like 
uh, cook together or you know find out about their lives and, and their, their backgrounds. Um, can I say something? I agree with you, but also kind of disagree in some ways, I guess. Because uh, you talked about public spaces, and uh, I had run a uh, public space for about three months, and uh, it's called Naze, it was downtown, and it was basically open to anybody who walked in. You could sit down, we had books, you could read, we didn't care if you bought coffee or not, you know, we didn't care if you brought your own food, just come in and hang out. And we had, um, we had people come in, you know, it became quite popular. We had people come in and who basically were talking to each other even if they didn't know each other because the seats were so close and you were sitting on the floor and, you know, people made friends with each other. But also we had a huge sign that said uh, no homophobia, no transphobia, no Islamophobia, no, uh, basically no hate in this space because we really wanted a space that everybody was welcome in. And I feel like to nurture that kind of space is really uh, quite simple. And the only thing you need to nurture that kind of space is uh, kindness. It's really uh, loving kindness, which is nidda in uh, Burmese or Bali. Because um, I feel like I do agree with you when you say, you know, people are really shy and people don't talk to each other. There's not much space to talk to each other in, but also I disagree that it's a Western culture that you're friendly to each other. I feel like if you, um, life is a really like a mirror. If you smile into it, it will smile back. Um, you know, you just need to, shouldn't be afraid to make the first step. Um, I'd like to add in, in a way that, like, because um, like, as an employer, um, all employers should practice non discriminatory um, you know, uh, practices at work because um, there are times when uh, I have had a previous, like, uh, uh, manager who helped me with the HR, and um, just because like that person is like is not a Muslim doesn't mean that like some uh, someone would suggest that oh you shouldn't hire them because she she, she did suggest that oh maybe you shouldn't uh, you, you should look at other uh, applicants first before like making that decision. So I think uh, this is that that's just not her. I think there are also other uh, probably other managers who have the same ideas and thoughts. And I think that to to be more uh, inclusive, economically, like at the same like workspace, socially, uh, I think what we uh, as employers, what we need to do is more like yeah, uh, to treat everyone, treat every applicant like as equals, and like try not to uh, uh, consciously discriminate, like consciously or subconsciously, like discriminate against like um, gender or like gender preference, like religion, race, the hiring process, and the process as well. So, you know, we talked, I think a lot of us in the uh, panel have Western education, uh, uh, but I think also we have to make a conscious effort that we're not, we're not Westerners, we're, we are Asians, specifically we are Myanmar people, you know. Um, and, and in that sense, you know, I think that's something that's a lot of, at the back of our minds, I think that's what we're thinking as well. Um, you know, um, the fact that um, you know, perhaps people who got to study in, in the U.S. or U.K. come from a, a small percentage of the country. You know, so, um, so I wonder what your other thoughts on you know what people in a country are thinking, um, but not expressing, you know, afraid to express. Um, I feel like people in Myanmar are afraid to express dissent. Dissent is basically uh, your opinion, which is different from the opinion of the majority. Uh, dissent is not anarchy, I do not support anarchy, and I don't think anarchy works. But dissent is necessary for any government and any society to function in, uh, in, any, so, uh, in any society. Because the set is basically you saying no, I don't, uh, I don't agree with what you're saying now, and uh, I'll think about it, and maybe I'll have a different opinion, 
or maybe I will agree with him. I get, and I feel like a lot of um, our culture is rooted in the fact that when, when we, once we hear something, we agree with it, uh, without question. And that is something that I have been taught, that I had to unlearn, and which was difficult, because a lot of people around me question why I was so hard-headed. So, it's something that we need to inspire in uh, more you know, students and more young people and old people, older people as well, because you need to have uh, curiosity and you need to have, uh, you need to question things, basically. And there, you know, if someone says the sky is blue and it is blue, but uh, don't believe it's blue, because it's not always blue. That's what I'm saying, if that makes sense. So I think I'm done. I just one more question uh, uh, as some final words that you want to say um, along the lines of you know some Myanmar youths that have inspired you. You know, again either in passing or uh, through your work uh, and the why did they inspire you? And also you know in, in a couple of years time, or, uh, you know how we want to inspire people. How do you plan to inspire yourself? Um, so, uh, two nights ago, I was uh, having uh, dinner and, and cocktails with um, my good friend. Uh, she's more of a mentor. Uh, her name is Mamiya Mizu, and she is the uh, founder and partner at Interior Design, MIT. Uh, if you've been to RTH, Rainbow Tea House, or Rao Ram, um, those are two of the many places she's designed. Uh, and she, we were just uh, having a dinner because I, I'm always trying to learn about the industry here and uh, you know what it's like to uh, practice uh, and run a, a design firm here in Yango. And um, one thing she talked about that really struck me was how she treats her, or, or how uh, her dynamic with her employees. Uh, she was explaining how um, one of uh, uh, for, for many of the, the young designers who come work for her, uh, they've never, you know, they might never have put together a PowerPoint presentation, uh, they might not know how to use a laser pointer when talking to a client, um, they, uh, maybe they didn't even know how to dress to meet a client. And so she was saying how she had to invest a lot, uh, and, and so she would hire people to come teach her employees, you know, um, how to put together a presentation. Uh, how to present yourself, uh, uh, how to talk to a client, how to write an email to a client. I think that these seem so simple sometimes, but uh, these are also hard skills that you know sometimes you just need to be trained in. And uh, uh, she took so much pride in the fact that she had uh, these classes for her employees. Um, and she also said, you know, a lot of the times she felt like a teacher more than a boss uh, to to her employees. And I think that's something that. Uh, a lot of employers in Myanmar need to, to, I think, more and more get used to it. And I think Hillary is a great example of that um, as well. Um, and so, you know, it's, and I guess, like, in practice, uh, if this is useful to any of the young uh, people here, if you're looking for an internship or if you're looking for a job, I would encourage you to look for a, job, uh, a boss or an employer who would invest in you in that way. Um, and I think in terms of final words, um, I, I think uh, right now there's a lot of talk about Myanmar being uh, full of opportunities and, and a lot, that a lot of growth can happen and a lot, um, that there's a lot of work for people to do, but I think that none of that is going to happen if people just you know, sit and wait. <laughs> uh, I think I also uh, do that sometimes. I sort of expect changes to happen, and I think in general the political sentiment is, oh, like government will fix it or Dosu will fix it. But you know, no, no one person can fix it, and I think we all have a role to play um, uh, in in realizing the Myanmar that we all uh, want and the, the Myanmar that we all uh, see in the future. As for an individual that I have come across
across with, not come across with, but she's an individual who is still working together with me. Um, so I'd like to share about her. Her name is called uh, Atta. Uh, she has been working, uh, she was previously working for uh, my parents uh, as a sales staff at one of the uh, our stores. Um, but she is from uh, PA and uh, she's been in Yang she's been with uh, working in Yangon for around like five to six years now. And uh, I didn't know her very much at first. And uh, when I just started working with her, I I, uh, I barely know her, but I try to get to know her. As I try to get to know her, she she is a she's just a typical sales star, but uh, but given the right opportunity and training. Uh, right now, she has grown to become like uh, one of our store managers and uh, someone who I can very much rely on as well. And I think one of the most um, yeah rewarding experiences about being an entrepreneur is that you can see people growing within your organization as the organization grows too. And um, I think that that's very uh, yeah uh, proud and rewarding for me uh, to see that like her have come along with me along, for a long way and um, I would say that uh, it's like I've said uh, previously before it's important to have like uh, you know a forward uh, looking uh, perspective and you have to keep on working you need to have your own way like, we need to have our grip and uh, if something that happens we can still uh, move on and focus on the future and if something good happens you'll be very ready uh, to take on that opportunity and I think uh, what we have to do is just to keep uh, focusing and working towards uh, yeah a better uh, for, for our own like better lives and for Myanmar a better country yeah. um, one inspiring person that I met uh, who still inspires me and who's younger than me is some uh, someone you on this side will know is Paul. Um, yeah, if you've met Paul, there are three things you're gonna hear first. Minglawa, Chano na may pochen, Chano pisi mandaba. There's three things that he always introduces himself. He's this his icebreaker, and then he'll basically ask you about everything that you are going to do or have done. And he's one of the most inspiring uh, young people that I've met in Yangon because he's only 17 and he's had uh, about so many projects that he's running or have helped run or came up with the idea and he's just given the idea to another person to run and um, yeah if you met him you will remember him uh, he's a curious person he's also kind he always treats everyone he meets the same if you you know if you're the driver of his cab, you're the lady who's selling him breakfast, he will ask you about your life, you know? So I feel like that is one of, uh, he's one of the people that really inspired me when I came back because I really try to be more like him because I w I'm a really shy person. I don't really like to talk to people who I don't know. And when I met him, you know, he just jumped in. So, <laughs> I feel like that's a quality that a lot of uh, young people should have and should uh, try to achieve because it'll take you a long way in life. If you go up to a person and you're genuinely nice to them and you're kind to them and you just want to work together, you want to collaborate, that's one of the big things that um, will take you a long way in life. As uh, some closing words, I would say uh, I know that leadership, in, uh, when people talk about leadership, people don't talk about happiness. And I would like to say that uh, happiness is very important when you're doing something, especially when you do something for the rest of your life. So you have to ask yourself if you're happy doing this, if you can stay in this situation for the rest of your life, and if this is going to inspire you in two weeks time, a month, you know, a year, six years, till you're 50. So, I mean, things do change, but also you need to have that drive to take you through life. And that drive only comes when you're happy. You can't do something for 50 years if you're upset or if you don't want to do it. It's just torture. So I suggest to people, just follow, 
cheesy. This is just follow what makes you happy, honestly, because you will be miserable if you don't. So, uh, so I want to open up the, the floor to all the people who you know, want to ask questions, and please do ask questions. Um, you know, um, I hope that you know, this panel is just an inkling of what we want to do at RV. You know. Um, uh, a place where people can feel comfortable you know, to be themselves, to ask questions, and, and most importantly, not just think for ourselves, but also you know, how to develop the country uh, by ourselves. So please do us some questions.
see you have, what I have observed uh, is that uh, I feel like the current government has um, doesn't have enough uh, input from because uh, they're they're of like yeah certain uh, there I think most of the politicians uh, in the government right now are around like fifties um, like the, early, the youngest would be like forties right so I think they don't have enough input from the uh, younger generation I would say and I think that will because Myanmar is very much like uh, we have a our, uh, our population is has a lot more younger gen younger people than uh, more like um, developed countries, I would say. And I think that it's very important to have uh, input from uh, a young. I would I would like to see more younger politicians in our government, and also we, I would like to hear more voices from the youth uh, uh, for the government to make like future uh, policies. Uh, as for your question about whether to enter politics one day, uh, as I, I I have thought about it, and I think that it should it would be an honor to to serve uh, publicly one day. Uh, after I decided to retire from uh, my business, <laughs> yeah. And uh, but sadly though, sadly, uh, right now under this law, because I'm also a very um, a Burmese Chinese. And um, my citizenship is not even, um, I'm calling it N, not, not like, I don't have a pink national ID card. I have a blue card. And currently under um, uh, under the current law, uh, I don't think N and N are allowed to run for office. And um, yeah, I hope that that will be changed in the future before I retire. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of uh, the po politics that is happening is very important right now because policy is the, the line of defense for a lot of people. And if we don't have policies that protect the most vulnerable people in our communities, which are who are people who are the most the poorest, people who are from minor minority ethnic groups, people who are LGBTQ, I, and also, more importantly, transgender people who do not have the laws that protect them. Some, we, we, um, people who are uh, heteronormative and Burmese and also uh, able-bodied take for granted that um, you know, the laws protect all of us. But if you are transgender, man or woman, if you are not able-bodied and you cannot get into a building, you cannot tell anyone to help you. you can't, there is no law protecting you you know, helping you to get into that building, or helping you put being put into the right jail cell that is not your born sex, but your chosen gender. You know, these are things that uh, are taken for granted, especially by I think polit politicians right now, because they need to learn. They, these things haven't been spoken of, and they're just being they're just coming out right now. So it is. Uh, it is easy to see why they do not know these things because we're all learning about them at the same time. So we need to be patient, but also not forget to protect the ones who are most vulnerable. Uh, as for uh, getting into politics, I feel like I'm already in politics. I'm no, not uh, in. You know, I'm not sitting in a room with a hat. You know, uh, but I feel that every bo every body. Like every physical body in this room is political. The way you dress yourself, the way you speak, the way you present yourself. If you're a Burmese and you speak English, that's political. If you're, if you're a Burmese uh, and you don't speak Burmese, that's political. You know, you have to think of yourself as a political body. And that is how you change societies by not being politics, by not wearing a, a hat and you know, not taking the oath. It's how you present yourself in a different way that is different from what people expect of you. I think it's very good point. That's just one point on the language. You know, um, I, I mean, I used to be so like proud that I can like you know use English well and I don't know very that well. And, and, and it's a really embarrassing thing. You know, it's, it's you don't know your own language. That's like you know one of the most the, the worst disservice that you can do to yourself. You know. So, um, yeah, and I, I think, you know, you were pointing out that we didn't even, all our books were all yeah, way yeah, in English, yeah, which, you know, which is true. It's so unconscious, you know, but that is so true. Yeah. So, um, hopefully, um, 
But then, I, you know, I, uh, obviously, uh, hopefully, you know, a lot of us will realize that you know we, our country is our country is beautiful, and we're, you know, we'll try to learn as much as possible. Um, I don't I don't think uh, a person going to politics, uh, but I um, but I do think that I want to be uh, you know maker of change agents. You know, uh, which is why I'm involved, I'm heavily involved in poverty. You know, um, uh, I think a lot of uh, understand mm -hmm. lack of understanding, misunderstanding in our country. Uh, stems on the fact that we don't have um, you know, education that allows us, give us the strength to question ourselves, question other people, but to build trust with each other. You know? That's why we have our leadership program where we draw people from all parts of the country so that you know, Chen and Chen and uh, Shan and Koho, they all can come to one classroom and learn with each other so that one day, one day, when, when they're in their 40s, 50s, they'll say, oh, hi, you know, we met each other in PLB class. And they both trust each other much more because they've had that experience, having learned together in that classroom. So I think I will. I think that that's that's my way of being a politician. <coughs> Any more questions? Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask a question to Matt Kenjianima. Uh, do you have a pen name? Uh, and then do you write in? Both in Burmese or English. Yeah. And then I'd like to know more about Nazi because I heard it's going to be closed soon. Um, and it's near my home, so I'd like to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, sadly, Nazi has been closed for about a few months because I've been studying abroad and there wasn't anybody to manage it <coughs> other than me, so sadly it's closed. And I don't have a pen name. Uh, because I feel like that is a culture that is uh, very, uh, I don't want to say old, but also very much in the hierarchy of traditional Burmese writing. And uh, as for your, I feel like it's a second question, I write in English and I haven't uh, written Burmese yet. And um, it's one thing that when I came back, uh, I discovered in coming into the writing community in Myanmar is there are people who write solely in Burmese, people who write in English, and people who write both in Burmese and English, and sometimes they don't talk to each other. You know, it, it's sad, it's quite sad because uh, I wanted to be friends with everybody, but also they, you know, there's this prejudice of, oh, you know, you're for a certain market and I'm for a certain market, and you know, your work is different from mine, so I can't appreciate your work, and sometimes there's this hierarchy that comes in when there's older, there's an older poet, older writer, and sometimes when they come into the room, you have to stand up. And uh, I didn't understand that, and I made a lot of people angry. <laughs> so, uh, going off topic, uh, that's also why I don't have a pen name, because I feel like I would be adopting a culture that I didn't grow up in enough to respect it. You know, if I had a pen name, and I didn't know what it meant, uh, to other writers who had a pen name, it would be disrespectful. So, yeah. <coughs> so, um, I, it's actually a question to all of you, or anyone else in the past in this room. That it, it was take one quote that uh, Edward said that like you are a Chinese Burma, uh, but you know you you have that identity crisis. And I think it is very important to uh, nationwide because that I have that is, this is not the first time that I have heard from someone who is uh, who is the ethnic minority. It's like if you are Kitchen, you would you would rather introduce yourself as you are Kitchen, not Gama. But you know, like and um, many people believe that it is one of the motives have like to the issues happening like the wars happening around the outskirts of Myanmar so uh, to like uh, what do you think that how that kind of identity crisis can be fixed to like uh, it's hard to say it's hard to put it in words because you know like, um, yeah because we don't really like, as a country, there is nothing that ties you as a Burma, if you're a Kachin, then you're a Kachin. 
that you don't really, you know, like, other than living in Bama, you don't recognize yourself as a Bama, especially when you don't receive the services that you receive in these cities. Especially if you're living in a really poor village, especially if you do not really hear a lot from the government talking about you. So, um, yes. Uh, it's a really tough question, to be. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, also it, it really falls on the, the shoulders of. Government. And I really hate to say this because it, it, it is people are responsible for treating each other fairly, treating each other with loving kindness. But if the government doesn't um, lead by example, doesn't treat people fairly who are not the majority of the problem, then that is uh, really, it's like a parent saying, you shouldn't do this, but then they go out and do this. Uh, you know, it, and like I said before, policy is really the last you know, barrier to protect people. And if there aren't policies that are fair, if there aren't, uh, and economics isn't fair, if, um, you know, we need to fix that. We need to fix um, uh, education, we need to fix uh, economics, and we need to really start to include people on a level, on a government level, and start <coughs> pushing policies uh, start pushing policies that include uh, that protect every individual and not just the majority. And I feel like that is uh, certainly a way you can empower uh, people who feel disinvented. Like they don't, they don't feel like they're part of society. And then when that happens, people in the society start to accept them as well. And I feel like that's one of the first steps towards it, but not the the whole answer. Um, yeah, I, I think it's hard, but I also think, you know, um, a, like I was saying, it's, it, it, it's a huge part of it is government, right? I think even representation in government is so disproportionate, uh, um, it's, it's so heavily in the law. And um, I also think that culturally, and not even just politically, culturally, I think uh, people here care a little bit too much about um, maybe differences <laughs> in, in your race. And, uh, you know, the fact that my Mabundin says I'm Shandio, you know, it's like, it's indicative of uh, difference, right? And uh, I think, uh, I don't know if there will be a day when, you know, that matters less and less, but hopefully, um, ideally, you know, think it, it, it would, <laughs> But um, I wasn't very comfortable using my my Burmese name as well. Like um, I've always been like Hillary since when I was like young, uh, throughout high school, even when I was abroad. Like I introduced myself as Hillary. But later, after I have like come back here, uh, I realized that I'm, I'm becoming more comfortable uh, saying that I'm, I'm Myanmar. I'm a Myanmar uh, citizen. I'm, I'm more comfortable using my Burmese name as well. I think that's nice, and it, uh, what, what made me change, I think, uh, would be that uh, because I could see myself, uh, my role in, in, in uh, shaping, uh, my, I could read like for benefits, well, I could read uh, economic benefits if I were to you know, uh, understand the people more. I would be, uh, if I were to be more accepted by my uh, colleagues who are also from this, right? So, I just start seeing like how I, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the reason is also economic. Um, I could see myself growing like um, uh, as a businesswoman if I were like try, if I try to become more Burmese as well. I try to learn from the Burmese uh, uh, our uh, uh, community here in my business and I build my networks here. But the people in the outskirts of the the, the Myanmar. They have like resources there. I think it's about a lot of it is about like the issue of uh, 
economic policy and how like the resources are not uh, allocated like fairly among uh, the country and like if the ethnic groups are uh, not getting out like as much as like they're giving to the central government then of course like there will be arguments there will be wars and uh, I think that they couldn't see themselves like benefiting from like, you know uh, sharing it with the central government that like there is also a lack of trust and like they couldn't see the economic benefits and the uh, the policies are not clearly outlined and I I think that's why there there is this problem and um, yeah uh, and I guess the government should do really a better job of uh, uh, tackling those um, economic issues in those um, uh, in those regions. I think you know it's not just like like you know, a country that we're facing this. You know, what is my identity? You know, uh, what is the, the the connecting thread with all these ethnic groups, ethnic cities? I think mean, it happens in other countries as well. You know, uh, uh, if you look at the U.S. for example, the majority of people who own businesses, companies, governments, they're usually Caucasians. You know, they they, they don't really represent. You know, the, the very few Hispanics, very few Blacks, very few Asians. In, in a power, power, um, you know, decision-making roles. So I think for us, then we cannot just like blame the government or uh, a governing body or you know, half the people. I think it's it's, up, it's, up, it's also a personal responsibility. You know, I, I kept asking these questions to a lot of a lot of people here, and the, I think the question here, I think it's, I think it's just at the end of the day, we're all human. Right? If you respect me, I'll respect you. Kind of, you know, like equation. So I think. Um, for us, then, as, as people who speak Burmese, I think we also have the obligation to learn to speak Shan, or to learn to speak Wichin, you know, at least one other like one other ethnic language. So, um, um, so it's just very simple. You know, if I come to your house, and I want to, you know, you want to, you want to be sure that you know, I respect your mom and dad. Okay? So I think the same thing for other ethnic people. I mean, if I go to the place, then I think it's quite fair to expect that I speak. Like, I just had three questions for all of you. Um, may I know all your ages? Because it wasn't right up here. Ages? Age. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one reason why I started this panel. <laughs> um, because I think uh, our culture you know, uh, underestimates young people a lot. Um, obviously, you know, we don't know all the answers. We're trying, uh, with the help of all of you, to grow and develop. Um, I, uh, I don't mind sharing it, uh, but I, I, you don't have answers. You don't uh, I'm 29. And uh, yes, I know I look well. Uh, second, your second question. As for the cronies, 
I think that uh, that is a that is becoming increasingly hard to uh, it's increasingly hard to become a promi these days. Uh, <laughs> I think that's what I would like to add. Um, there are uh, business uh, businesses are becoming more competitive. It's much easier to set up businesses now than it was before. And even uh, if like the promis have great like benefits from the previous uh, regime. Um, they uh, they are also uh, going to be competing against like foreign players who are coming into the market as well. So I think the uh, competition wise in, uh, in the market it has increased and it has become increasingly hard for the uh, for many companies as well. So I guess in the future it's also going to be uh, more of a level playing ground than it was before. Um, I think, so ideally my, my vision for five years later is uh, to be back here. Um, I, I come back quite often, I come back, well, not as often as I'd like, but I come back once or twice a year and uh, I'm always trying to be in touch with the, uh, uh, you know, the going on here. And I'm hoping that in five years I can come back and uh, start to establish my own practice here, uh, doing architecture and interiors. Um, in terms of the crony question, um, it's <laughs> I, I think uh, um, the, like Hillary was saying, I, I agree, I think it's, it's going to become uh, harder and harder for them to do the kinds of things that they used to do, especially with uh, changes. And also, uh, you know, many of them have um, some sanctions on them um, from foreign governments, and, and, and also a lot of multinational companies um, also vet you know, their potential partners here. So I think there are a lot of things that already um, uh, are in place. But I think in terms of um, the future, um, I think you know, we can only hope that at this point that many of the people who've benefited tremendously under the previous regime we can only hope that they would do great things with what uh, you know the companies that they founded. I think that uh, many of them, you know, and I'm not going to name them, uh, are some of the biggest companies right now in Myanmar, and uh, you know, many of them are playing huge roles in uh, financial services, in banking, uh, in establishing you know hotels, airlines. Um, so a lot of the basic uh, services that a country needs uh, are being built by them for both good and bad. So I think um, uh, my hope is that they will continue to, uh, you know, do good business down the line. Um, excuse me. So what was the second question? Where do you see yourself? Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, I see myself. Uh, I I plan to go into academia, and I plan to do more research in my field of study, which is um, sociology in gender studies and identity politics. So I hope that in um, you know five years, six years, that I'll be able, uh, I'll be, I'll have enough knowledge and I'll, I'll have enough experience to come back and maybe uh, teach, hopefully. And but that that is uh, ideal. And uh, for your third question, uh, cronies are tricky. They're smart. They're clever. You know, and this is why they're in that position. <laughs> you know, and uh, we need to be smarter than them. We need to be more clever. We need to. Um, we already know what they're doing. You know, it's very obvious. If we don't say it, but we know it. But the only reason that they're there is because uh, they acted quick. It could have been. It could have been anybody, but they were the people in those positions at that time that. Um, their luck gave up to them, and they became lucky, and now they're in those positions. And I, I do, uh, I, I do understand the sentiment that you said about how they're providing basic uh, services and really heightening uh, Myanmar to be, you know, um, you know, we have hotels and companies and banks because of that. But also, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes behind, and that happens behind closed doors that we do not know of, you know, and that may damage our country more than it benefits the country. So 
I guess what I think about them is not negative, nor positive, but it's, uh, you know, they're really clever, you have to give it to them, but it's not good. <laughs>
uh, if you're, that's a really good thing that you're trying to do, but what you said about NGOs and monetizing it is true. There's no way to avoid it. But the thing is, if you want to avoid it, you know, start small. You can't uh, have a huge building and, it, you know, you can't have a huge building and uh, people coming in, talking about stuff and having dialogue. But you have to start small the way we did. We had uh, a small group of four people and we hung out there and then we started to have an idea. So more people came, more people came, and then it became a bigger thing. So slow, if it grows slowly, it, but it's still growing. So you need to ha start to have a community, build a community, and then if that community is willing to occupy a physical space, then you can start to grow, and then you will reach more people, and then more people from that. So I feel like um, the advice I can give you is to start small. Also, one thing, you know, I think if you have a very compelling vision, that really helps as well. You know? uh, that's that's our case with uh, Power Me. You know? We all we had was an idea to create a not-for-profit university, um, um, all based on donations. You know, and a lot of and it's, it, it was very difficult in the beginning to to get you know funding and any sort of funding. Um, uh, but then I think once people started to recognize that. You know, their money is will never come back to them, but then uh, the, the money will uh, will make something will create something good. You know, uh, and I think if you have a very compelling reason, that I think there's scarcity uh, does exist. Okay? I think you can you can um, overhaul them on, on uh, you know side step side uh, step that if you have a very compelling vision that can spin well. Thank you very much, Matt. Okay. I can tell you now. And go with you. And the audiences for your questions. And I would like to thank you to give the token of appreciation to our guests. And I would like to go. Oh, okay. <laughs> And that's the way you do it.